My interest here, I, I, I think, dates back to my early working life in direct marketing, where what seemed absolutely inarguable was that there was a lot going on which was not explained by the conventional marketing model or by conventional approaches to research. So I felt it was a little bit... I mean, if you imagine, I, you, know, you could take the book um, Longitude as an example, and the Harrison's Clocks. There what you had was a system of navigation which was very, very good at knowing latitude through the use of a sextant in one dimension, but was absolutely hopeless at knowing longitude. And they at least had one advantage, I think, over the conventional approach to marketing and research, which is at least they knew they didn't know about longitude. What I think we have is a system which is we've become incredibly attuned, if you like. Now, if you take theoretical physicists, okay, they're not stupid. I think we can agree with that one. And they've tried really, really hard to boil everything down to one fundamental physical force, but they've basically given up and they accept the fact that there are four. There are multiple forces at work. Electromagnetism and the strong nuclear force, atomic force, weak atomic force, and gravity, okay? And they cope with four. If you want to navigate a ship, you accept the fact that it's not enough to know about the winds, you need to know about the tides. Problem is actually that if you're actually in the middle of a clear space of water, you can't actually see the tide. And what we've done is we've developed systems which are incredibly alert to detecting, let's say, gravity, but are absolutely blind to electromagnetism. And, we, and as a result, I think that the marketing model has limited predictive value in two senses. One of which, because it's incomplete. And we can have this huge argument about how incomplete it is, but the fact is, it's incomplete. Okay? Stuff goes on which people cannot even explain. So actually, ask, you know, the, the, I mean, David Ogilvy, slightly naughty, I mean, he's a, he's a market researcher by background, after all, said the problem with market research is that people don't... Uh, um, don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. Now, that, that, you know, that's a little bit of an extreme um, uh, bomb to place under an industry, but what's, what's inarguable is that it is incomplete, our knowledge. And I think that causes us to fail in two ways. One, we have limited predictive ability uh, in terms of what actually happens. Secondly, we may dangerously overemphasize the wrong things. Thirdly, we may approach problems from the wrong direction. Uh, you know, exactly that problem of I must be top of mind when actually where you need to be is bottom of mind. And as a result, we focused on system two thinking, on the kind of thinking we're aware of and that's visible to the exclusion of all else. Uh, there's, a, there's a fourth thing, I think, which also makes the marketing model very, very dangerous, which is it isn't really aware of its own limitations either. And one of the most valuable things you can do as an agency is to say, don't bother you're going to lose. You cannot achieve this level of behavioural change. Mark's, Mark will elaborate on this further. You know, there are certain effects, as in complex systems, you know, human behaviour is much more akin to meteorology than it is to conventional engineering. You know, it's effectively we're dealing with complex systems, and just as a butterfly's wings can create a hurricane, equally it's very difficult to create a hurricane because the computational power required to know where to flap that wing simply isn't available. Okay, so the other thing we possibly do is we actually don't have, I mean, I would argue, looking at behavioural economics, that all these people trying to um, launch Me Too iPads might as well not bother for five years. You, you could actually save yourself, you know, half a billion quid in development money and just not bother for five years and actually save your money to do something spectacularly radical in three or four years' time. The reason for that is just there are certain framing effects. If something becomes the kind of, you know, category default norm, everything else in economic terms may be, for a time, just seen as an inferior good. Huge amounts of human perception are relative. Enormous amounts of human decision-making actually operate at a level of what are known as heuristics. Now, just to prove, I don't normally do props. This is a vast <laughs> book edited by Gerd Gigenrenza uh, exactly about this subject of heuristics, which are the cognitively miserly rules of thumb that people make to make decisions. Uh, I'll give you a really, really, really obvious one, which is very, very common, which is that if you present people with three things, regardless of what those three things are, a cheap one, a medium-priced one, and an expensive one, a very large percentage of people just choose the one in the middle. Okay? Yeah. That's just a heuristic. 
Actually, what's interesting about these things is these were always regarded as heuristics and biases, as if it were evidence that actually these heuristics were imperfect ways of, of, mm. of making decisions, which we'd evolved simply because we're cognitively lazy or inadequate. And actually, what mathematics is starting to show is these are actually, in an uncertain world, these are extremely good in their predictive ability. Actually, buying the one in the middle is a pretty good course of action. The cheap one's probably rubbish, and the expensive one's probably a rip-off. Um, but understanding the fact that most of this stuff goes on at a, at a non-conscious level and therefore is invisible not only to market research but to the people we're researching and to us ourselves, expect, except perhaps through experimentation, is really, really vital because I think what it will prevent is an enormous misdirection of marketing effort and attention to places which aren't necessarily the places where you actually affect behavioral change. I'll give you just a couple of examples. I worked for American Express uh, for years, and every now and then we decide that we needed to refresh one particular product. So we'd go and come up with a new product proposition, we'd research that, we'd develop creative work that was researched, you'd come up with, you know, five different forms of, of, of proposition, uh, um, five, three different creative expressions of the proposition, you'd go and research those. And you'd get, without giving away confidential figures, you'd get a noticeable increase in uptake from communications. Then someone, actually someone very junior with a very small budget, would just decide to redesign the application form to make it a bit easier to fill in. And actually applications would go up by 50%. So actually, the extent to which we focus on persuasion is just dangerous to start with. In many cases, it seems to be apparent, and there's a very good book by Byron Sharp on this, that actually our attitudes are a product of our actions, mm. not the other way around. That actually we do things, Bob Dylan puts it beautifully in Brownsville Girl, people don't do what they say they believe, they do what's convenient and then they repent. Okay? <laughs> um, Paul Dolan and I coined this phrase, where we both have to do a massive caveat saying this has nothing to do with us, it's an observation. If a man says, my wife doesn't understand me, it doesn't mean he's going to have an affair, it means he's already had one. <laughs> The brain, in many ways, the conscious brain that research addresses and listens to, is less like the Oval Office of the self, making executive decisions. It's much more like the press office. The decisions are taken somewhere down in the basement, <laughs> and actually then the rational brain then desperately issues press releases to make apparent retroactive sense of its past actions. So what blokes don't do, just being clear about this, is they don't go, actually I'm noticing some declining cognitive uh, issues with my wife, <laughs> and so I think it might be time actually to outsource uh, some of my sexual services to maybe, you know, offshoring or trying a lower cost supplier or something. <laughs> uh, what actually happens is people get pissed at a party, and completely against their intentions, or indeed better judgment, they end up sleeping with someone, and to make desperate sense of their past incongruous actions, they start blaming it on their wife. <laughs>